Good morning and welcome to worship here at St. Andrew's Community United Methodist Church where our mission is making disciples of Jesus Christ. I'm so glad that you have joined us for worship today and I want to say a happy Father's Day to all of our fathers out there. For every man in our church family today, we have a special gift for you. It's a special devotional called Rooted in Christ. You can pick it up right out here in our foyer, so I hope you'll do that today before you leave as we celebrate all of our fathers and give thanks for the fathers in our lives, the men in our lives who have made such a difference, and also for our Heavenly Father. We've got a lot of great things going on in the life of our church. You can check them out in our bulletin or on our website or on our St. Andrew's app, but we are so glad that you have joined us for worship today. We also want to say a special welcome to all of you who are worshiping with us online, and a happy Father's Day day to you as well. Would you go with me to the Lord in prayer before we get started today? Holy and wonderful God, we are thankful for you, for all that you mean to us, for all that you have done, all that you are doing, all that you will do, and all that you are. We praise your holy name. It's in the mighty name of Jesus that we pray and everyone said amen. Let's stand as we worship together.
Would you remain standing with me? And as a family of faith, let us affirm our faith together. We believe in God the Father, infinite in wisdom, power, and love, whose mercy is over all his works and whose will is ever directed to his children's good. We believe in Jesus Christ, Son of God and Son of Man, the gift of the Father's unfailing grace, the ground of our hope, and the promise of our deliverance from sin and death. We believe in the Holy Spirit as the divine presence in our lives, whereby we are kept in perpetual remembrance of the truth of Christ and find strength and help in time of need. We believe this faith should manifest itself in the service of love, as set forth in the example of our blessed Lord, to the end that the kingdom of God may come upon the earth. Amen. You, you may be seated. It is such a special day as we celebrate fathers, and every time we come around to Father's Day each year, I love to think about the lessons I've learned from my dad. I've learned so many lessons from him over the years, but I remember one time in particular that really touched my heart. We had a basset hound growing up, and her name was Muffin, and if you're not familiar with basset hounds, you might know that they have the really long ears, long bodies, but they're kind of mopey and they sort of mope around, and Muffin was just your very stereotypical basset hound. But we loved her so much. We got her when she was a puppy, and she'd run up the stairs, and she'd trip on her ears because they were so long. And then as she grew older, she just became a part of our family. But then as she got even older, she came down with cancer. And it was so sad the day that we had to decide to put her down. And that day, the vet came to our house, and I remember my mom and my dad and I were all there. And I still remember the place we were in the backyard where we knelt down beside her. She was laying on our patio, and the vet came and was doing the things that she needed to do. But I'll never forget, as we're all sitting there, and I was just about 14 years old, and this was the first experience I'd ever had with something like this. But I watched my dad, my dad who loved this dog. They were best buddies. And I watched him as the pain came across his face. And then I watched him take his right hand and he just placed it on Muffin's back. And in that moment, as Muffin faded into sleep, I remember looking at him and thinking, wow, here's this big, strong man who was my spiritual leader, and he was being touched by this little animal who was going to be with God. And in that moment when he put his hand on her, I remember taking my right hand and doing the same. And we stayed there and we cried. And I will never forget that day. Even though no words were said in that moment, I learned a very important lesson from my dad, and that is that all life matters. All life matters, from the greatest, most important person in the world to the lowliest animal on the planet. And as we think about that today, the lessons we've learned from our dads, the lessons we've learned from the men in our lives, it's important that we put those lessons into practice, for a lesson is no good unless you put it into practice. So today, as you think about what you will give, I hope that you will remember that all life matters. And when we give of ourselves, we're giving to the lowliest, all the way up to the highest, and everything in between, so that other people might know who Christ is. So I hope you'll think on that as you give today. There's three giving stations here in the worship center. There's two up front, one in the back. You can drop in your offering during the singing of this next song or on your way out today. Thank you for giving generously on this Father's Day. That once was crowned with thorns Is crowned in glory now The 
Good morning. St. Andrew's is a loving, caring, overcoming community of faith centered in a relationship with Jesus Christ. And you know what else? We believe in the power of prayer. Paul encourages us in Philippians 4, 6 to um, instead of worry about everything or anything, pray about everything. And I don't know about you, but for those of us that struggle with worrying, that's much easier said than done. I get this false sense of uh, security or false sense of like I have any control 
when I worry about something rather than releasing it and letting it go to God. So as we prepare our hearts this morning to pray instead of worry, as we prepare our hearts this morning to release and let these things go to God and trust that he has them, you'll see names scrolling on the screen behind me. And for some, we don't really know what specific prayer needs that they may have, but we know that God knows what they are. And we trust that God is at work in their lives and will answer those prayers. But for others, we do have some specific prayer needs this morning. Um, many are battling cancer this morning and today, and we um, pray comfort and peace for them. We pray wisdom and discernment for the doctors. We pray a complete healing that God would rid their bodies completely of the cancer that they're battling. For those that are homebound, we pray that they would know God's love this morning, that they wouldn't feel alone, that as they worship with us online, that they would feel just as present in this moment and in this sanctuary as we are right now, that God would um, place his loving hands on them. For the missionaries who we support both financially but also in prayer, we pray for boldness. We pray for open doors that God would give them opportunities daily to share his love, to share the gospel, to share the truth of Jesus Christ to those that God has placed to serve, that they would know Jesus in a saving way. For expectant mothers, we pray for um, protection. We pray for some cooler weather as they battle um, the heat of the summer and being pregnant, and we pray for um, a healthy and happy baby at the end of it all. And those that are deployed, we pray for their protection. Um, we pray for the families that are back home that are worrying, that are struggling with knowing that their loved ones are maybe somewhere that they don't even know. We pray that they would have peace as well this morning. Um, but then also this morning, we want to pray for the fathers. We want to pray for the men in our lives, both the 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 like natural fathers, but also we have spiritual fathers, and we have father figures, and we have men who have played incredible roles in our lives, and we want to pray a special blessing over all the men this morning, that God would bless them abundantly to be a blessing, to continue blessing those around them. And then the many unspoken prayer concerns, we lift those up and release those to God as well. Um, as DA prepares to come up and share the message that God has put on his heart, let's lift him up in prayer this morning as well. Will you pray with me? Father God, we love you and we're so thankful for the ways at which you are at work in our lives and you are at work in the life of this church. We feel your presence this morning and we thank you for your presence. When we were in need, when we were broken, you sent your son. You sent nothing else. You didn't send money. You didn't send anything but your presence. And we thank you for that this morning. We thank you that you know our prayer concerns. You know our needs long before we speak them, long before we Think them long before we even know them. And we trust, Lord, that you are at work in our lives, that you are a good God who loves us, who desires to do good things, that you are a faithful and loving God. This morning, we pray for your will to be done in our lives, for your will to be done in the life of this church. We pray for healing and miracles in your name and for your glory. We pray for reconciled relationships, those of us that maybe are, are hurting this morning because of a broken relationship. We pray for miracles and reconciled relationships, Father, that you would bring those relationships to healing and back together. We pray for boldness and courage to share your love and your truth with a hurting world. There's so much evidence around us of how badly this world is hurting, how badly this world is in need of hope and in need of you. And so we pray, Father, that as we are in this series learning about the church, that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit to be the church in this community and, and beyond, to be the church, to, to help those that are in need, to help those that are hurting, to give those that feel hopeless and helpless, to give them hope and knowing that you love them and that they're not alone. We pray, Father, that you would... Um, Fill D.A. with your Holy Spirit this morning, that you would anoint him, that you would speak boldly and clearly through him, and that you would open our hearts to be receptive to your message, that it would transform our minds and it would transform our hearts, and we thank you for your presence and your word and all of that. Thank you for the power and the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus, and for the prayer that he has taught each of us to pray. Our Father 
who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So a man was traveling through the countryside and his car broke down. There was no place for him to stay and he happened to notice that the nearest building was a monastery. He walks up to the door, he knocks on it, the monks answer and he explains to them that his car is broken down and he asks if he might be able to spend the night. They welcomed him in, they said yes we can provide a room for you and we can give you a meal and they even fixed his car for him. But that night as he lay down in his room, he had a little bit of difficulty sleeping. And part of the reason for that was because he could hear this sound. It was a beautiful sound. It was an alluring sound, like when the sirens were trying to lure Odysseus into crashing his ship. It was something that he could not shake, so he really did not sleep well that night. The next morning when he got up, he talked to the monks and he said, Last night as I lay down, he goes, I, I heard this most wonderful, beautiful sound, and I wonder if you could tell me what that was. And the monks looked at him and said, we can't tell you what that sound is because you're not a monk. And so the man was discouraged, and he went away. But he never forgot about it. He continued to think about it, even becoming obsessed with it. And so it was that a few years later, he went back to the monastery, and he knocked on the door, and he said, I don't know if you remember me, my car broke down, y'all took care of me. He goes, but I, can you tell me what that sound was? And they said, we're, we're sorry, we can't tell you what that sound was because you're not a monk. And he said, well, I've got to know what that was. What do I have to do to become a monk? I'll do anything to know what that sound was. And they said, well, if you would be a monk, here is your task. You must travel the earth, and you must count every blade of grass and every grain of sand and explain to us what you have learned. So the man went off on his quest. Some years later, when he was tired, his hair had turned gray, he went to the monastery, he walked in, and he said, I've been on my quest, and I can tell you that what you ask me to do is impossible. That creation is ever changing and always being in a state and process of change. And only God can know the answer to the questions that you have asked me. As for humanity, all we can know is of ourselves. And if we dare to strip away our self-deception, then we can know other things. And the monks all began to smile and they began to applaud and said, Congratulations, you are a monk. We can now show you the sound that you have wanted to know. And so it was that the head monk walked him down this long corridor and they came to a, a heavy wooden door and the, the monk gave him a key and he opened the door only to find behind it was another door. It was a door of stone. Once more they handed him a key and he opened the door to find another door, a ruby door, and they handed him the key. And so it went on till there was a, a diamond door and a pearl door and an emerald door and a sapphire door. And then finally he came to a gold door and they handed him a key and said, this is the last key to the last door. The man slowly turned the key and, and began to push the door open knowing that something he had devoted his life to was about to be explained. And when he looked in, he had this overwhelming sense of amazement, and he fell on his knees as he saw what was making the sound. But I can't tell you what that is, because you're not a monk. Oh, that's not even fair, is it? Thank you for not throwing rotted fruit at me. I am grateful for that. I guess if you really want to know, you've got to count all the blades of grass and all the grains of sand and find out what that man found out. But, but I was... 
thinking of that story this week, and, and I found myself thinking, you know, when we talk about the church and how to become a church, it's not at all like becoming a monk, <laughs> at least not in that story, that God doesn't expect some impossible lifelong quest that is difficult for us to find out an answer to what we know. When, when we talk about the church that God has created and that God continues to create, we can see very clearly as we begin to read Acts chapter 2 that God had this design for what was going to happen. We read in that chapter, and we've shared this the last few weeks, that, that all those who believed in Jesus were gathered together in one place. That's what Jesus has said. I want you to wait here until the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And, and as they were there to celebrate Pentecost, all of a sudden they heard the sound of a mighty rushing wind. They saw these tongues of fire sitting on everyone, and they heard everybody speaking in their own languages, and yet they would hear them in whatever their language was. And so it was that this outpouring of the Holy Spirit, when people are baptized in the Spirit, that God is creating the church. But those who believed that Jesus was Messiah weren't the only ones gathered there. There were others who wondered what was going on, and when Peter explains it to them, they're convinced. And so they ask the question, what, what do we have to do? And he said, repent of your sin and turn to God and be baptized. Peter continued to teach for a long time, and 3,000 people were added to the church that day. When God was creating the church, this small group now has increased by 3,000. 3,000 people who believe that Jesus is both Messiah and Lord. And so we might ask the question, is that it? Is that all one has to do? Because they found in this spirit-filled group of people, a group of people to belong to, and that's what we call the church. Not a place, but a people. Is that all there is? Well, as we continue to read through Acts 2, what we discover is that there were things that these people devoted themselves to, things that they suddenly had an overwhelming sense of commitment to, that I believe is a recipe for how we best live as a church. This is not a, uh, an unusual scripture. This is one that I think most of us know. So let's go ahead and put that up there, Steve. And uh, I would ask you to read this out loud with me. All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. Brothers and sisters, this is the word of the Lord. And so, that's what they began to do. They devoted themselves to each other, and they devoted themselves to certain practices, if you will, that are foundational for the church. And I'm going to just be honest and up front and let you know that if you are someone who has been very well churched, if you consider yourself to be a mature person of faith, there is nothing new that I'm going to say to you today. It, 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 this is all foundational stuff. This is stuff that if you have, have been following Christ for a long time, this is stuff that you probably know. I'm not going to pretend that this is some great new revelation. And yet I also carry with me the sense that whenever we gather together for worship, there are always people present that may not have that much experience and may not have understanding of these foundational things. And so I want to have all of us think about this, but mostly for those who may not understand, I want to answer a couple of questions. And the first question is this. Who are the apostles? Who are the apostles? They devoted themselves to apostolic teaching. Who are the apostles? Now, if you're thinking to yourself, well, uh, I mean, you know, can you name them? <laughs> one of them would be Peter. Because he's the one that had just explained everything there in Acts chapter 2. So if you guess Peter, you're right. And if you're saying, oh gosh, you know, what were those other 11 guys' names other than Peter? Well, one of them was Judas. He wasn't there. Something happened. But there were 10 more, and if you want to know what their names were, look in Acts chapter 1, I think it's verses 13 and 14, and it'll give you a list of those 10 other names. But then as you also read in Acts, it will say how because Judas had gone off and killed himself that they needed to replace him, and so Mattathias was elected to be the other apostle and that's when we see that being an apostle has criteria if we're going to pick someone to take Judas's place 
what are the qualifications of this person? Well, it had to be someone who had been with them from the beginning. Someone who had heard what Jesus taught. Someone who had witnessed the miracles and the great things Jesus did. Someone who had seen Jesus resurrected from the dead. That was the criteria. And yet, could we devote ourselves to apostolic teaching when those 12 are now part of that great cloud of witnesses that surrounds them? All those 12 have died. All those 12 are not here for us, although we continue to know some of the stuff they said because as apostles, they wrote the, most of the New Testament, the things that we learn. So what more can we say about apostolic teaching? Well, apostleship is a gift of the Holy Spirit to some people who have experience with Jesus. Now, in saying this, I want us to be clear. Not everybody that has an experience with Jesus is gifted by the Holy Spirit to be an apostle. We find this out when we read the book of Ephesians, and here's a scripture that it has there. It says, now, there are gifts Christ gave to the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and teachers. So an apostle is a person who has this Holy Spirit gift to serve in an office of the church, if you will. When Christ is creating the church, when God is creating the church by pouring out the Holy Spirit, these new believers devoted themselves to apostolic teaching, and that apostleship is a gift of the Holy Spirit. So one of the things I hope that we would gather is this. An apostle is someone who has experience in relationship with Christ. One of the things that I uh, am sad for my children is that my two favorite sports teams have not won a championship while they've been alive. I speak, of course, of the Cincinnati Reds and the Dallas Cowboys. Neither team has won a championship since my kids were born. I don't blame my kids for that, though. And if you remember the Cowboys of the early 90s, they, they were a dynasty. Three Super Bowls in four years. They had a lot of great players that are now in the Hall of Fame. And, and one that joined them for their last run at the Super Bowl was one of the greatest cornerbacks in NFL history, the man simply known as Prime Time, or in his old age, they've just shortened it to Prime, and that is Deion Sanders. Deion Sanders, one of the best cornerbacks that ever played in the NFL. And while he was at Dallas, he had money, he had fame, he had reputation. Everything that most people would want, Dion said he had. But Dion had a tremendous hole in his life, a vacuum, if you will. He said he was enveloped with this darkness, and it was so bad that one night he was prepared to take his own life because of it. And somehow or another, God broke through the darkness in Dion's life. And Dion had this dramatic conversion experience where this man who was flamboyant in everything he did was now going to be flamboyant in his faith. And shortly after his conversion, there was actually a church on the northwest side of our metropolitan area that invited Dion to come and speak. Now, I don't have any idea how much that cost, but it's not in our budget. I'm pretty sure of that. And they invited Dion to come, and I found myself thinking, how interesting. This guy's been a Christian for just a few weeks, but they're asking him to come and talk in worship. Now, the reality is, if there's anything that excites us about our faith, it's hearing the testimony of somebody whose life has been dramatically changed and forever altered by what God has done in their lives. And I'm sure for the people that were there, it was such a blessing. The only reason I knew about it was I saw it on the news because it was a newsworthy kind of thing. But I would suggest to you that while it was good to hear his testimony, he could not have offered apostolic teaching. He had not been a person of faith long enough that he had matured and grown and understood. When we, you, you talked about spiritual fathers, you know, the, the people that wrote the New Testament, Peter, Paul, James, John, those are our spiritual fathers. Those are the ones who 
tell us what we need to know and explain to us how things are supposed to work. And so that leads us to the second question I want to answer. What were they teaching? We, if, we, if we know who the apostles are, the apostles are people that saw the resurrected Jesus. And if you read scripture, Paul always referred to him himself as one that was untimely born. Because while he did encounter the resurrected Lord, he did not see Jesus the way the rest of the apostles had. But they share with us a simple message. Because the apostles, let's be honest, when the church started, they weren't having Bible study. The Bible didn't exist. The Bible's made up of letters that they wrote to churches to encourage them then in how to live. It's not like the 12 formed an editorial board so they could publish some kind of curriculum or catechism for the rest of us to learn from. Although in scripture we would say there's curriculum and catechism for what we ought to believe. But they didn't do those things. The apostles could teach them one thing and one thing only. They taught these new believers, these 3,000 people, about Jesus. That's what they were trying to do. That's what Peter had done when he preached on the day of Pentecost. Is And, and, and let's connect the dots. You have to remember who was there when all this happened. All the people that were there were Jews. And some of them had believed Jesus as Messiah. Those were the ones who received the Holy Spirit. But of the thousands of others that were there, some of them were the people that were in the crowd yelling, crucify him. And some of them were simply Jews that had come to celebrate this Pentecost holiday. And they just said, this Jesus whom you crucified is both Lord and Messiah. And when Peter preaches, he starts with the prophet Joel. They're Jews. They understand the prophets and the promises. They have been longing, they have been aching for the Messiah to come so that they could once and for all be delivered from the things that oppress them. And so... What they were doing is they were teaching them the answer to the most important question we ever answer, which is, who is Jesus? And this is what we see at the end of Matthew's gospel. Remember, Matthew is writing to help the Jews understand Jesus is Messiah. This is what we uh, read at the end of Matthew's gospel. This is where we get the mission of our church. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. They're teaching about Jesus, what he said, what he did, and the reality was that he had risen from the dead. And because they're teaching Jews, they go back to the prophets. They go back to all of those promises that God had made about here is who the Messiah is going to be, and here's how you will know the Messiah. Now let me ask you this question. How many prophecies of the Old Testament did Jesus fulfill? I mean, we know from reading Isaiah, you know, behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a child. We know that he shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. We know that he would suffer, that he was bruised for our transgressions. How many Old Testament prophecies were fulfilled in Jesus? A lot. I know, you're looking for a specific number, right? A lot. I did some research on this this week, and there's not even consensus. The first one I read said that there were over 300 prophecies in the Old Testament that point to Jesus. The next person I read said 456 prophecies. The next one I read said 574 prophecies. (laughs) It, It was a lot. A lot of things that we understand and are foundational to our faith were taught about how the prophets' promises were fulfilled in Jesus. I mean, it's pretty amazing. Foundational stuff. These new believers devoted themselves to these people who had much experience walking and talking and witnessing all that Jesus did, who understood the tradition of the Jewish faith and how these things are all fulfilled in Jesus. And yet one of the things that we know, part of what we understand, especially those of you that were teachers or are teachers, it doesn't matter how good of a teacher you are if people don't learn. It does not matter what the apostles teach if we are not committed 
to learning. It wasn't just that they told them things. It's that these new believers were devoted to learning what the apostles were now teaching them. Most likely so that they could then go and tell other people as well. That's kind of our uh, method for discipleship, isn't it? To know who Jesus is, to grow in relationship with Christ so that we may go. One of the things that I find it is that the longer I'm alive, the longer I have to seek apostolic teaching to help my discipleship, the more devoted I have to be to learn things because I'm sometimes content just to go with what I already know. And yet, one of the reasons I continue to read Scripture is because I continue to learn about how it is God wants us to live, how it is God wants us to be a part of the church. One of the, the shows that you may have watched on TV, I watch a lot of TV, I've only watched bits and pieces of this show, it's called Antiques Roadshow. Do y'all watch Antiques Roadshow? Yeah, old people. We do that because we see stuff and we know what it is, that young people don't know what it is. But Robin and I used to, uh, before we had kids, <laughs> decorated our house with antiques. We still have a lot of those things, and so Antiques Roadshow was an interesting show to me. And... Uh, if you've watched the show, you know that what happens, Antiques Roadshow, they announce they're coming. People bring their antiques because they want to have them appraised. They want to know how much it's worth. And sometimes people walk away disappointed. They thought maybe they had a great treasure and they didn't. And other times they walk away completely stunned at how much something they had is worth. One time, Antiques Roadshow was in Secaucus, New Jersey which really is unimportant to the story. I just like to say Secaucus, New Jersey. How often do you get to say that in a conversation? A woman came and she, she brought this small table and the appraisers look at her and they say, well, tell us a story about this. She said, well, she goes, back in 1967, we bought a house and uh, the entryway, I, I wanted a little table to go in the entryway. Didn't need to be too big. And, and I saw this table at a garage sale. And, you know, it was about the right size of what I was looking for. And it was kind of an odd shape. So I thought, hey, this, this might be it. She goes, but it was really dirty and grungy. I knew I was going to have to clean it up. But, uh, you know, the woman at the garage sale, I said, how much do y'all want for this? And she said, we're asking $30. And she said, I only had $25 on me. You know, who argues over $5 at a garage sale? And so she bought a table for $25 that had sat in her entryway in her home in New Jersey. She brought it to Antiques, Gold Show, uh, Antiques Road Show, and the appraisers that were there said, okay, well, well let us tell you what this table is. This, this is not uh, just a common table that everybody would have. This is actually a Seymour Brothers table table. The Seymour brothers built high-end furniture for people living in Boston, and this is actually a Seymour mahogany card table. That's what you have here. And we, we, we don't want to excite you, but um, depending on the market and what's happening when you go to auction, you could get as much as 225, 250,000 for this table. If you wanted to sell it to us today, we could only give you 200000 for it. They failed. She got very excited. <laughs> she actually took it to Sotheby's in New York City to auction away, and as she was listening to the auctioneer, and it got up to 200000 and then two hundred and twenty-five and two hundred and fifty. dollars You know, that, that was exciting enough as it sell, but when it actually sold, it sold for $490,000. A $25 investment turned into almost half a million. I got $25, I bet. <laughs> I would be willing to do that. See, the, the woman that sold it to her, just she didn't see any worth in it. But they found out it had a lot of worth. Brothers and sisters, when we apply ourselves to apostolic learning... We grow in a faith that is priceless. 
not worthless. A faith that is unshakable even when we are shaken. A faith that is powerful even when we feel powerless. This is what the apostolic teaching began to do. It, it strengthened the foundation of faith in answering the question, who is Jesus? And the second most important question, and what does that mean? Because Jesus is both Messiah and Lord. And so I, I, I wonder, as you consider this yourself, as you, as you think about your discipleship, have you devoted yourself to apostolic teaching? Have, have we devoted ourselves to being this community of faith that belongs together because of our faith in Christ? Have we devoted ourselves to the place where our faith has grown in such a way that what other people see as weakness we know is being filled with overwhelming power? And if you haven't, you know, really devoted yourself to that, I, I want us to be encouraged that this is one of the things we envision when we brought Pastor Josh in as our pastor of discipleship, that he will help us understand how we devote ourselves to this, how we make disciples who know who Jesus is and know not only who he is, but how our own lives are strengthened so that we then go forth and help other people discover this faith in Christ, too. Whether it's through a small group or a Sunday school class, whether it's through midweek when that starts up again in the fall, how devoted are we to apostolic learning? Because that's a key ingredient for what God has created the church to be. And the good news is, you don't have to be a monk to do that. Would you all pray with me? So, holy God, we bless you today. We thank you, Lord, that in all your goodness, you just connect all the dots and unfold the story of how your plan is fulfilled in Jesus and what that means in our lives. And we pray, God, that, that if we have grown lax or we have been lazy and submitting ourselves to the teaching of the apostles, that we wouldn't beat ourselves up, that we wouldn't deprecate ourselves because of a lack of what we think we should do, but instead, O oh Lord, that you would light a new fire in us, create within us a hunger that can only be satisfied by knowing you through your word and through the teaching of those who have experience with you. Because, God, we know in this, your plan for the church is better fulfilled. And so we offer ourselves in this prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Beloved, if y'all want a time of prayer during our closing song, always know that you can come and do that. But I just always like to say, this is my favorite hymn, so don't screw it up. As you're able, would you stand as we sing together?
right, y'all did really good, so we're not going to take an offering, and you don't have to listen to another sermon. Go in peace. <laughs>